a guy like Assange, um, and and you know this 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 guy who leaked information to Assange. I mean, they they want to be regarded as heroes. You know, I mean, usually you're you're a hero if you catch enemy spies, if you harm enemy operations. But now you're supposed to be a a hero when you uh, sabotage your own country's defense, right? So. Um, Harming your own country is now considered a good thing. It's whistleblowing. It's it's nice and dandy, and it's gonna save us all. And so, um, uh, Julian Assange never acted like a journalist. He had no training as a journalist, and he was not an expert about war and intelligence. Everyone knows journalism has boundaries. You cannot post mountains of classified data. And, uh, you know, endangering people in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, people who gave intel to coalition forces against the radicals. Now, imagine, imagine if a traitor like Robert Hansen had not sold his intelligence to the Soviets, but published it on the web and accepted donations. Could he have claimed to be press? Certainly not. Now, Assange can expect a normal trial because America is not Russia. And uh, notice the influencers talking trash about Navalny or ignoring Navalny, but they will glorify Assange and turn him into a martyr, right? Um, and in a courtroom in the United States, we may finally get more information, you know, things that were previously classified about the damage he may have caused. We may see blurred, blurred out photos of dead sources from Afghanistan and Iraq and dead family members. We, we may get internal info from within WikiLeaks because there was a young informant inside WikiLeaks who handed over hard drives to the US government. Uh, witnesses may explain things. And of course, Assange does not want this. Neither do the Russians. Um, he is worth he is worth more dead than alive right now to the Russians. So watch out for that. Um, and uh, WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks could have simply used bits from the material they had turn it into a story with context. So the United States could not, the, the US couldn't leave Iraq and Afghanistan overnight without radicals taking over. And Iran was heavily supporting the radicals. But Assange wanted the sensation. He wanted the staggering number of documents out. He wanted to be the man who, quote, ended two wars. So this is when a guy like Assange suddenly gets power and immediately that guy abuses his power and he doesn't care who uh who gets harmed in the way and so uh wikileaks was always part of a larger older global movement of hackers and activists so um this really started in the 80s right um and so that's when you already had organizations such as uh the the german chaos computer club so these were guys who were using who were using all kinds of techniques to gain access where they shouldn't be getting access now this is of course the essential skill of a spy right you have to improvise you have to impersonate somebody else you have to claim you have the right to access this and use all sorts of trickery and this is what these guys did so um even before the early internet they called it freaking now, this is when they um, they used a small type of whistle and they were uh, whistling certain tones into a telephone to make long distance calls for free because the system was set up in a way that um, there was a, a communication by these tones. So if you mimic those tones, you can, you know, have long distance calls for free, for example, or classic technique. Uh, you pick up the phone, you call somebody and say, oh, hi, this is, you know, you know, you call somebody at his workplace and say, oh, oh hey, here's John from the accounting department. Uh, we lost some some stuff here. Uh, can you please tell me this and that? And, you know, quite a lot of times this person would then give you information because he thinks you're John from the accounting department. So this is how it started. And then these activist groups like the Chaos Computer Club that was linked to WikiLeaks, these activists, um, they wanted to appear legit, but then something happened. And that is commonly referred to as the KGB hack. Now, this is part of hacker hacker legend, okay? So this was um, the, late 90, the late 80s, okay? So this was um, 
1985 until 1989. German hacker group um, headed by Karl Koch and the other guy was Markus Hess. Now, old school hackers, they know these names. There were Hollywood movies done about them. And uh, so these were... Um, these guys, they broke into American systems. The same stuff that Assange did when he was young and he got caught. Um, they broke into American systems, stole information, and they sold this information to the KGB to finance their cocaine habits, right? Uh, well, at least this one guy, Karl Koch, he was a cocaine addict and he he spent his money on more cocaine. Now, um, when... Uh, when uh, so when they broke into a United States university, um, when they they broke into a United States university, a very smart American man uh, noticed a discrepancy, and he improvised an intrusion detection system, kind of like an early firewall, right? So he collected all the printers from the university and he installed them at the entry points of the system that they had, so that the printers would start printing out the log files of what was happening in real time. So this is how he could find the intrusion points. So then he figured out, because of the time when these hackers were active, he figured out they must be from a specific time zone, you know, on Earth. And this time zone was the German, West German time zone. So he gets into contact with the German authorities and they finally actually catch these hackers. And... um this Karl Koch guy, he ended up dead, um, burnt to death for whatever reason. It's, it's still not exactly clear who killed him or if he killed himself. May have been the Russians, who knows. Um, and so this became a gigantic embarrassment for the hacking community, which was very left-wing. Uh, and so the, the German Chaos Computer Club, they... Um, they, they wanted to be very, appear very legit, so they did activism with publicity stunts. So they were finding some security flaw in the mobile phone system. They got attention for that. And more and more, they kept doing activism against government tools needed to catch Soviet spies. So they hate, I mean, up to this day, they still exist to this day. So they hate surveillance cameras, which are a nightmare for spies. Um, they hate biometric systems, which spies completely hate. Um, they hate uh, databases in general. Anything useful, they are against. And so this is kind of the larger activism scene that uh, these people came out of. Um, what I got here is the book by... Uh, this is the book by Daniel Berg. He's the German guy who joined WikiLeaks early and became sort of the number two guy... Um, for quite a while. And uh, this 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 character, this Daniel Berg, he was a member of the Chaos Computer Club. Now, uh, this organization was founded in the office of a left-wing newspaper, and they had the table, the, the actual table, I think, of the first communist commune in Western Germany. So they saw this table as sort of a a relic as something very, very important and honorable. So they were proud they had an this table. holy relic, uh, so to say. Yeah, this was um, this was very important to them. So, um, and um, and so yeah, and so this was kind of where these people came from. Now, Julian Assange, essentially, when he was a young kid, like 16, 17 years old, Assange, he did, Assange did the same stuff that these German guys had done. You know, Karl Koch, you know, the legendary hackers for the KGB, you know, uh, Assange did the, did the exact same, same thing, used the exact same techniques. He broke into American systems and he got caught and then he sort of collaborated with the police in Australia and Victoria um, to catch child pornographers on the web and stuff like that. And we don't know the full extent of what he did for police. Um, and so th because of that work, he got off easy um, when it came to his hacking charges. I mean, some people say he could have gone to prison for a hundred years for what he for what he did, um, because every intrusion became an expensive problem for America. I mean, you know, the hackers always said, "Well, he didn't break anything, he didn't sell anything, or whatever." 
but if there is an intrusion it's a thing you know it, it 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 costs money to fix there has to be a security review what was compromised possibly etc cetera, etc cetera. so he caused a lot of financial damage and he he um he caused americans to waste their resources on a security review so that's why he could have gone to prison for like 100 years but instead he gets a small fine a very small fine and he gets off because he collaborated with police but he is known to be a very very vindictive character he hates authority um and and he's this is very vindictive so he hates the system the western anglo system he totally hates it apparently wants to destroy it and this is how he uh came to start wikileaks because it was a stressful time of course he was a young father i believe uh very soon thereafter um, he, uh, he, he barely stayed out of prison and, um, and he was in, in, um, he was in therapy at the time, if I remember correctly. So very stressful time. And he thought, well, the system was at fault. The system did this to him. So he wants to break it. He wants to just smash it and destroy it like a little kid. Um, and so, uh, then he starts to work. He actually gets a real job and he makes some money. And apparently he wanted to use that money to travel the world. Um, it says the Eastern Bloc, but it's very, very murky because he's a liar. I mean, he wants to represent the truth, but when it comes to himself, there's no transparency. He lies about everything. And even this guy, this German guy, Daniel Berg, was a sen who was essential in creating, you know, building up WikiLeaks... Daniel Back was noticing that this guy constantly lies. He told several different versions of every story. He told completely false, improbable stories. And so there's a lot of stuff we don't know about Julian Assange. There is like a five to eight year gap in, his, um, in Assange's history. There's years where we don't know where he was and what he did. Right? So... Um, he he starts to create WikiLeaks in 2006, round about 2006, and uh, and and I want people to notice the timing. Okay, so um, so during the Bush years, the Russians were careful in their propaganda. They they the Russians did not want attention for themselves. They wanted to trash the United States. Um, but everything everything changed around 2008. 2008 is the year of the, the Georgia invasion and, and more aggress aggressive Russian propaganda. And right at that time, 2008 forward, this is when WikiLeaks became a thing. And um, uh, so this, um, this German guy, this German guy, Daniel Berg, he's fairly left-wing. Um, an early French communist author, I think it was Pierre Joseph Proudhon, is his favorite author. I mean, that guy was was just just an idiot communist uh, and very anti-Semitic, by the way, this Proudhon guy. But he loves communist ideology, Mr. Berg, and uh, his wife, his later wife, she's a communist politician. She's actually um, a politician for the extreme left party which is the successor of the Soviet East German um, party, right? So, um, so that guy, Daniel Berg, he hears about WikiLeaks and he wants to join. And he actually gets to join. And so he, he manages, he, he, he invites Julian Assange to Berlin uh, for the annual big hacker convention of the Chaos Computer Club. Now, this is a big event, and they always whine about, you know, surveillance and, and, and stuff. Uh, so um, nobody at this point really knows about WikiLeaks. So Assange gets to speak in, in a basement room, basically, in front of 20 people. So this was the first official presentation um, of WikiLeaks. And, and then things started to happen. These leaks started to happen. And it was always questionable where this material came from. Because um, the way the WikiLeaks system was set up was an anonymous Dropbox. It's like an anonymous mailbox. You can use a specific online technology to submit stuff. And WikiLeaks could then claim we had no idea where this comes from. 
And this is a form of, I call it data laundry. It's like money laundry, but for data. And so for data that's come from classified sources, um, classified sources could be, uh, you know, could be any source whatsoever. It could be an intelligence agency, you know, they they could claim they don't know where it comes from. Um, I forgot to mention one thing. This is from uh, this was from Austrian Austrian media, uh, one of the biggest newspapers there. Um, they talk about this old famous hacker case, you know, Karl Koch. Um, which was the case was turned into a movie. I think it's the movie's called, I think, 23. People can find it online. It's called 23. Uh, nothing is what it seems. Um, I'm translating this here. Um, and so this, this, this character, um, this character, Karl Koch, this infamous hacker, he was also a truther. He was into conspiracy books and he started to see signs everywhere because he was on drugs and he was reading this conspiracy stuff. And so, um, um, yeah, probably it was the same motivation that we saw with the famous trader um, John Walker with the Navy. Because Walker in the Navy was also a truther. He read all these John Birch Society books and he believed in the grand conspiracy and he thought uh, the USSR was the smaller problem. Right, so maybe that was the exact same framing for the infamous hacker Karl Koch. Again, it's all about framing. You know, if you make people believe certain axioms, you know, certain foundational beliefs, and you can make them believe all kinds of stuff. And what I wanted to mention is that um, uh, there was also um, there was also a documentary about the Karl Koch case. Um, this documentary was done because the case got all this attention again due to the the big movie and um for this documentary um they uh for this documentary they talk about a f they, they talk with they speak to a former colleague a former colleague of vladimir putin about this karl koch case for obvious reasons because in you know in in the late 80s uh, in the late 1980s, uh, Vladimir Putin was stationed with the KGB in Dresden, and he was working alongside the Stasi. So there's a certain likelihood that um, the Karl Karl Koch operation was running through his desk, essentially. Um, so that's a whole another interesting uh, parallel here. Um, now, um, when I mean the the moment WikiLeaks became truly famous was the helicopter video. Now this was this was a, a video. Maybe people remember it. Um, two helicopter gunships uh, flew a mission in Baghdad because um, coalition forces were regularly attacked by insurgents there, and so there was there was uh, enemy fire. So they they sent out these gunships. And some armed people, some armed combatants were running around. And in between these combatants, or very close to them, were two journalists. And so um, the helicopter gun gunship crew, they have these small monitors, you know, with the, the thermal optic, for the thermal optic cameras. So it's really hard to see or distinguish, um, you know, a camera, a large camera from, let's say, an RPG or an, an AK rifle. So um, there were fighters in the area, and this was kind of a tragic incident. Now, of course, these two journalists, Saeed Shimag and Namir Nor el -Din, it wasn't really smart to run around uh, that area um, with these other people. That was not really smart. So it was a tragic case. It didn't really tell us that much. But WikiLeaks became really famous really famous for publishing that um, that video. And then, of course, uh, the Iraq logs and Afghanistan logs. Uh, the source was the same as with the helicopter video. It was the young U.S. soldier Bradley Manning, who was mentally unstable. He now lives as a woman. And uh, he was this young kid who was always bullied his entire life, and he was also bullied to some degree in the military. Um, and so um, this this young kid, he had no real concept of how to judge the war and, and individual operations. So, and and Bradley Manning was tied to some hackers back home. Um, he was part of a, a scene, you know, the the hacker nerd scene, right? And so um, he was 
he decided to leak all these databases to WikiLeaks. And according to American authorities, um, Assange instructed Bradley Manning uh, to gain more access to information. Now, this may be this this is going to become a very important point in the court case once Assange actually is in the United States, because it's a dif- it's it's a difference if you have an anonymous Dropbox, you know, for submissions. Um, and you say we don't know who the source is. It's a whole nother ball game if you instruct a guy in a military base how to gain more access to classified data. Because at some point you're just talking about espionage, right? Um, and so yeah, so these databases, they contain some interesting bits and pieces. Um, for example, these um some of these Iraqis, um, some of these um some of these Iraqi units, they uh, they tortured suspects, but um, it was a war, and we now know, and this is also, uh, you know, interestingly in the documents, um, it was a big influence of Iran. So Iran was arming the the crazies. Iran was directing. Um, Iran was directing the crazies in Iraq, and we know who's behind Iran. It's the Russians. Yes. So the Russians, the Russians obviously wanted um, America out of the region, and here comes Julian Assange magically with these databases, and he wants to be the guy who ends two wars. Now, of course, every moron should should have understood that America could not pull out overnight um, because these crazies would take over. Which is exactly what ultimately happened, and and the Obama administration they wanted a way out, and Assange gave them the pretext. And um, I was wondering about the role of the Democrats um, at at the time because, um, in my understanding, the security measures at the forward operating base where Bradley Manning was working, um, in my understanding, the security was much better than he realized. He thought security was lax. He downloaded the databases, um, burnt them on a CD and labeled the CD Lady Gaga, right? So he could smuggle them out. Um, but probably all these military systems had software installed that was invisible to the user and would detect, you know, strange behavior. So maybe Bradley Manning was compromised from the very first moment. And also... At some point, Bradley Manning confided in Adrian Lamo, who was also a hacker, and he also got into trouble once. And uh, Lamo then alerted the authorities, and that's when Manning was caught. So maybe we should look at some people in the look at some people um, from the Obama administration. Maybe somebody had the motive to let this progress further, because somebody needed a pretext to get out of Iraq and call that, you know, some sort of a political success. So I think that that's something that people need need to be aware of and that people should look into. Um, so it was possible for WikiLeaks to, you know, take bits and pieces from the documents and then make a story out of it with context, you know, talk about the Iranians and um, talk about the crazies that wanted to, wanted to take over the region. But no, Assange wanted the hype. He wanted the big sensation, and and that's what they did. And so, who knows how many sources got compromised? You know, sources for the um, uh, the coalition forces. You know, people and with of families. Course, once you once you compromise this stuff, you know the Russians have access to it. So then the Russians are going to you know, and it's it's better than spying because they're getting it directly. Julian Assange is a is is a kind of freedom fighter. And uh, and so nobody gets blamed for giving all this stuff to Russia and China, because they can they can actually sift through the details and pick out things that you and I wouldn't even know was giving the game away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and it's like when um, when these big newspapers got this material, it it was uh, Der Spiegel in Germany. It was I think the New York the New York Times and the London Guardian back then. Uh, so they got the material like six months in advance before everybody else could could look at it, and um and uh, I, I I of course I read all the reports done by these papers and they tried to degree to be responsible. They didn't want to give out um 
details um, and what these papers uh, specifically mentioned was the influence of Iran. And uh, so this this was um, there were quite a bit of um, there were quite a bit of um, you know there's, there was just so much intelligence about it from these field reports. You know they they were starting to figure out where these weapons came from and where where who was contacting what unit and stuff. So it was it was Iran and it was also Pakistan. And um, this is not something that the activists focused on. You know, they didn't want that stuff. They just wanted America out of the region and they wanted America to look as bad as possible. Um, so for the mainstream media, it was sort of a compromise. You, you give the audience um, some juicy details, you know, some gory stories, um, but then tell the audience the context. So this is what, you know, journalists did. And uh, of course, I don't trust the Spiegel. I don't trust the Guardian. I don't trust the New York Times. Not as far as I can throw them, um, but there's some level of you know expertise there, and and you know the governments are you know of course they there are laws that would limit what a newspaper can do, but Assange and his people they were everywhere and nowhere. They they created this impression early on that WikiLeaks was a giant organization with different departments and and just experts everywhere but as the german daniel berg explained um for a long time it was just these two guys it was julian and it was daniel and they had one old server before they upgraded to a couple of servers so they could not provide security um for the data security for the sources they could not understand the material because they were not trained in these um matters and they did not have the manpower to go through hundreds of thousands of field reports. In fact, uh, if, if this book on WikiLeaks and UFOs is any indication of their understanding, they completely misconstrue everything because they're just using the communist context for understanding everything they see. So they're not even properly seeing anything. And I think, I think what really got Julian Assange in trouble, though, was that some of his WikiLeaks, he leaked things that were embarrassing to Russia. And I think that might be why the Russians uh, ended up you know, asking the the uh, well, used in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, uh, they it was funny. R the Russians met with the Ecuadorians shortly before the Ecuadorians gave him over to the Americans. So I'm thinking that he did something to annoy his Russian friends. Yeah, and, and I mean, it, they were they were getting tired of him. I mean, at some point, um, WikiLeaks published these uh, diplomatic cables. You know, it was also a giant data dump of, um, you know, diplomatic communications. And uh, there were sources referred to or named in those documents. So this is very, very dangerous. And um, somewhere on the yeah, Wikileaks... And by the way, it was in those diplomatic cables that information prejudicial to Russia came out because yeah. it was our diplomats talking about really nasty things the Russians were doing which was what interested me in WikiLeaks is like, wow, our government isn't totally stupid about the Russians. They know that they're using the mafia, that they're using criminal organizations, that they are a criminal organization, you know, the Russian services, and that they're working against the West. Yeah. And so that was, that was encouraging. But of course, the Russians couldn't have liked uh, that part of that leak. These diplomatic cables were stored on this, the, the WikiLeaks server. Um, this was the on, this was the unredacted version. This was the, the original version of it. And uh, the, the, the files were hidden in a, a, a subfolder and it was password protected. It was encrypted. But then uh, many copies of the stuff, uh, th this stuff, the server was mirrored, as they call it, onto other servers. So the original cables were also spread around. And at some point... Um, at some point in in one of the books on WikiLeaks, they actually tell you the password for these files, and um, and and at that moment, these journalists believed that this was just a temporary password, that this was no longer active. Um, but it was still active. The data was out there, and then of course anybody could just get the unredacted versions. So this is the level of incompetence that you saw at WikiLeaks over and over and over again, um, because they pretended to be a large organization, 
but it was run like a cult. And this is also something that, that Daniel Berg notices. I mean, at some point, WikiLeaks was attacking Scientology, but Julian Assange was acting like a guru himself. Or they attacked a certain bank, but Julian Assange wanted to hide all the money and have zero transparency. Um, well, what about, about what the rape? Doing. What do you think about Julian Assange, the rape charges in Sweden, him claiming that this woman was a CIA agent? Well, actually, I, um, I think he claimed yeah. she just had connections yeah, yeah, yeah. to the CIA through somebody else. I look, yeah, I looked what at do you this. Think at, of that? I looked at this at the time, and and it's it's like this: um, people who people who worked with Julian Assange, um, people who were close to him, people who liked him. Several people said that he acted like Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones at the height of his fame. So he was just playing up his fame everywhere and he was he was very pushy with women and he wanted to meet women all everywhere. And so then um when these two women in Sweden when they went to the police um and this became um this became like a, an actual case there was a response at some point from Julian's lawyers, and people can find that online. It's uh, it's it's still up there. And these lawyers basically said that, okay, um, our client really wasn't nice to these women, and they described the details. But they say, well, it's not enough to prove a crime. But th still, there's the admission that Julian was um, acting in a... Uh, Julian was acting in in a very bad way, um, and according to and, and according to these women, these women told these stories um, about him. You know, they were surprised at, at his behavior, and they didn't understand immediately themselves. Was this a crime? I mean, they started to talk to each other, and then they talked to the police, and and it's like, I mean, it's it's a certain type of behavior. You know, they accused him of intentionally breaking a condom. Um, having sex with one of them, um, they accused him of having sex with one of them again while that person was sleeping, and she woke up and asked, um, "Are you wearing a condom?" And he was making a joke, and uh, it's it's just, I and mean, that was it, Anna Arden, right, the Swedish. Lady. Yeah, exactly. So even well, it's, even it's what yeah, even if and, even if by by Swedish law, even if if you cannot prove a crime. It's still very questionable behavior, and that type of behavior lines up with what many others have explained about Julian Assange. Men, women, people close to him, working with him, they all describe him as this very narcissistic character. Nothing is ever his fault. When he gets accused of something, he always calls it a conspiracy. And um, it's like when he accuses the CIA, um, this is almost, well, not almost, this is exactly what... Um, this is exactly what what uh, spies will say. Or this 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 character in Germany, he's accused of of being a, uh, of having worked for the Russians. This case, this 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 court case that was going on in December, um, a foreign intelligence, high ranking foreign foreign German intelligence agent, um, apparently or allegedly sold secrets to the Russians. And the first thing he said when he had the opportunity was, "This is all a conspiracy against me by the Americans, by the CIA." I'm completely oh, innocent. Wow. Completely Oof. innocent. It's the CIA that wants to frame me. So, yeah, I mean, this is what a spy would say. And also, this is what a narcissist would say. Because this, well, this gets is like you... the dog ate, ate my homework kind of thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. That whenever this... you do something wrong, like you get caught robbing a bank and you look up, and you go, oh, no, the CIA did it. I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, like um, it's, it's the archetype reaction from a narcissist because this is very typical um when they would um just just completely turn things on its head you know turn something on its head and say i'm the victim here and julian always wants to be the victim he's always the victim no matter what he did no matter what the evidence is it's always it's always a conspiracy against him and um by claiming the cia did this to him um he tries to get the public's attention and he wants to create this public outcry because he may think that this outcry will ultimately help him right so um he wants this these activists to be his army he wants to use them um and um yeah this is this is sort of his his behavior um is 
his behavioral pattern, really. This was observed by many, many people. And I mentioned this quickly, uh, I mentioned this briefly earlier. Um, so in, in the 1990s, in the 1990s, Assange was caught, he had hacked into American targets. And then he got off easy. Oh, right, right. When he got off easy in court, so people have to imagine he could go to prison for 100 years, but he just gets a small fine because he took a plea agreement, a plea deal. So he has to pay this fine. It's on his record. And then he starts whining. He says this was uh, uh, this was misrepresented to him. He, he didn't he doesn't accept this plea deal. Um, he wants to have a clean record. And, and, and the prosecution deceived him. It was a conspiracy against him. So, and that's why he's now a, a, a convicted man. Now imagine he gets off so easy and he still claims this is a conspiracy against him. And, and he should get preferential treatment. He should walk free with you know, nothing on his record. It's like, wow. And, um, and, um, yeah, so that was that stuff. But, um, when, uh, Daniel Berg, the German guy, when he left WikiLeaks, he wrote this book. It's called Inside WikiLeaks and it was turned into a movie. Um, there are some really worrying things in the book. And sometimes I don't think that Mr. Berg realizes how worrying this stuff is. Um, so, for example, there's this. Um, Mr. Berg explains the following. Uh, when he was, when Mr. Berg was in the 12th grade, so that must have been, um, so, so he must have gone to a certain type of school because only that type of school has a 12th, you know, uh, year. And so in his 12th year, he was in a student exchange program in Russia. And so he lived with a guy, he calls him Vladimir, but this is just a pseudonym. So he lived with Vladimir in Russia, I think it was Moscow. And so uh, years later, for you know work reasons, um, Daniel Berg uh, goes back to Russia, to Moscow, to work at a to, uh, to, to work on a, a, a big server room, right? And he's frustrated with how the Russians are messing everything up. So he has to fix that server room. And he thinks, well, I have to visit Vladimir again. You know, the guy that I lived with um, in the student exchange. So um, Vladimir apparently became very successful. Um, so Daniel Berg asks him, so what do you do? You know, what's what's your job? What do you do? And Vladimir says, um, I, uh, I, I, I give favors. That's his answer. That's his job. That's his job description. I, I, I give favors. He had four girlfriends and he gave every girlfriend a car and, and an apartment. You know, it's just, they own the apartment now. And, um, what Daniel Berg found really impressive was a piece of paper in Vladimir's car. This was a, a document from the chief of police and the document said, leave this man alone. And he describes how this guy, Vladimir, how this, uh, how this, this character, Vladimir, was racing through the streets. Didn't care about the speed limit, didn't care about safety rules, nothing. He was racing around like a madman and he had the special paper from the chief of police that said, I'm untouchable. What was Vladimir's real job? I mean, he could have said, oh, I'm, I'm in real estate or I do this, I do that. He just said, I do favors. Was this man FSB? Was he mafia? Wh what? What? I mean... Tell me, um, there's some kind of an intelligence connection here. Yeah, and it's like it's like Daniel Berg was not even worried about that. He's just sharing this little anecdote uh, as a curiosity, and I'm like, this sounds like an this guy sounds like FSB or mafia, which are all but, you know, but tied you see, anyways. He's directly connected to WikiLeaks people. Uh, yeah, and so I mean, of course, uh, Mr. Uh, Assange has got what 18 charges against him now for this. Uh, espionage he conducted through stealing secrets and publishing them. Um, I think there was a hearing on Tuesday 
in London, and I think it's the we're getting down to the last round. I uh, think that the U.S. is going to have two sessions of explaining their point of view of extraditing him. And Assange's wife and other people are claiming that if he goes to America, he's going to die. That's what they're saying. Yeah. And and that's their claim. Now it'll be interesting to see if that is what happens. But of course, if the Russians can get at him and kill him, maybe that they'd rather have that. Yeah. You know, and then they'll blame the CIA. Exactly. You just they just don't know. I mean, recently, um, I think it was Alex Jones, he he insinuated that Navalny was killed by either the CIA or people who are against Russia, you know, to make oh, yeah. uh, to make Putin look bad. Same thing was claimed. Same thing was claimed when uh, Boris Nemtsov was killed uh, close to the Kremlin when he was shot. People mm -hmm. in the West, some some very uh, well-known people actually claimed the CIA killed Nemtsov to make Putin look bad. Um, and the same thing with Dugan's daughter, by the way. They claimed that the Ukrainians killed Dugan's daughter, mm -hmm. which could be true, but... Um, we don't know. But, uh, you know, the thing is, it's more likely because their government, the whole system in Russia is based on killing and assassinating people. Yeah. That it would, it would somehow ha some kind of internal conflict was ongoing. Yeah, and I mean, it's like um, there are people that were involved in WikiLeaks that we don't even know. Okay, so in the imagination of the activists and and the followers and the fans, you know, in this imagination, these key members of WikiLeaks that you see on television, they were always working together in an office building and you know, working on the next leak or whatever, but that was not really the case, especially in the uh, most important years of WikiLeaks. Assange was always traveling. He was always somewhere else, and he was mostly communicating with uh, Daniel Berg through an encrypted chat program. And so suddenly Assange would appear in Germany he, and just knock on the door, right? And, um, and he would constantly obfuscate uh, and and just um, cover his tracks, and he was described as very paranoid and um, just constantly concerned about about his own safety or that people might might track him. Um, but um, there was a character that was apparently very close to Julian Assange, a uh, a forty year old woman at the time, uh, and and uh, uh, Daniel Berg is not saying the name of that person he just refers to her as the nanny because she was sort of running assange she was always in the background and solving problems does for he him. give any hints to the nationality of this person um i don't think so no i don't think so hmm. it's just he just says a woman and she was like 40 years old and uh it would take some digging to find out um who that was but that was just a general problem of wikileaks you don't know where Assange was most of the time, who he was working with, who was instructing him, who was handling him, we just don't know, right? And so mm -hmm. people sent in this information, people donated to WikiLeaks, and it was just this black bag of this this kind of this, you know, buying the cat in the bag. You didn't know what was in it. And, um, and that's not the only thing. So people think that Julian Assange was some kind of a genius, you know, that he programmed the secure anonymous Dropbox. Well, he didn't. This was apparently another German who is also not named in the book. They just call him the architect. So he created this elaborate system of obfuscation so people could submit intelligence to WikiLeaks and have this data laundered. Okay, so um, they, they call him the architect and they will not tell you who that guy was. And, um, and this is how they operated for a, um, for a very, very long time. And uh, and Daniel Beck says that he's never in his life met a stranger character than Julian Assange. And mind you, Daniel Beck was a member of the Chaos Computer Club, and uh, many hackers were strange. You know, they were on the the autism spectrum, or they had ADHD, and they were on medications and whatnot. But he said Assange was just different. He was the most, he was the strangest human being he's ever seen in his life um sometimes sometimes the data is not well protected so let's for example the the dnc mails right um and um when a vulnerability that's what they call it when a vulnerability is discovered um word gets around quickly so um 
one guy finds the vulnerability, then 10 others find it, or the Russians find it and others find it. And so sometimes it's difficult to exactly uh, determine um, who was, you know, the the thief because um, these vulnerabilities spread around fairly quickly. Sometimes without most people even knowing about it, it's when you are inside of these hacker circles, you get, you know, you get the word, hey, um, there's a server with a vulnerability and you can actually get stuff from there. And that's how people actually um, break in and, and take this information. So sometimes, sometimes let's say the Russians, a Russian intelligence or a, a group or a Russian, um, a Russian hacking group, uh, let's say they find a vulnerability. Um, they can use middlemen and cutouts to uh, tell some, some people in the hacking scene or somebody hey, there's a vulnerability, you can check it out. So there are many ways to have data stolen. And, and uh, there are ways for, let's say, the Russians to obfuscate the role. And that's why it's, it's, it's complicated to find out who the original thief was. Um, because oftentimes, multiple people attack the same target at the same time. Now, these hackers, they, they have automated tools they can have their laptop and then they scan entire IP ranges, meaning they will check out 100 or 500 computers uh, or servers. Um, they will check if there are any known vulnerabilities. So for example, somebody didn't update something on the server, they're using an old piece of software or an old plugin. So they run the scan and then they find a certain number of servers that are vulnerable and then they immediately know how to break into this. And um, that's what makes it so complicated. And usually WikiLeaks says they never knew their sources. But um, with, you know, Bradley Manning, there's compelling evidence that um, they were chatting. They were chatting with each other and anybody could enter a WikiLeaks chat and say, well, I might have something and then this ticket gets escalated and um, maybe you can get to speak to Assange um, directly. And so um, at some point when Assange is in America, I think we'll get more clarity about that because Assange always thought his uh, chat system was um, unbreakable, you know, because it's, it's just like a, it's a chat room that changes places. It's almost like a, um, like a like a radio operator in the old times who switches locations right or a middleman radio operator who just relays information but um i think that i think that um wikileaks dramatically underestimated the capabilities of the the nsa or the british gchq because they were so far ahead and um we may get some interesting stuff once assange actually is in the united states if he gets to the United States alive if the Russians don't kill him first. So, and what do you think about the Gusever story? Gusever being involved in those emails. Well, that's 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 what I what I meant by uh, different people finding out about vulnerabilities and different people stealing the same stuff at the same time. So, um, you don't have to steal it yourself. You can just find mm -hmm. a vulnerability and then use middlemen and cutouts to tell some dude somewhere in the world, hey, there's a cool vulnerability. You want to check that out? And so this is how... So, uh, so a Romanian hacker yeah. who maybe knows hackers in other countries who figured this out. Exactly. So this is how um, somebody can, can obfuscate his own role in facilitating a theft of information. You don't have to do it yourself. You just have people tell other people, ah, you should check this server out or this particular thing because it's vulnerable and it's easy to hack into um, it's got juicy stuff on it it's got hillary clinton being yeah. mean to her colleagues and saying exactly. mean things about people exactly and um yeah i mean it's like it's like once these guys have a bit of power they start um they start abusing this power and julian i think in 2012 uh julian assange got a television show on rt which is which is russia today i mean it's it's yes he I, did they they cannot broadcast anymore. Um, they've been shut down. But this was a popular television station, and Julian got his show, and he was promoted um, to a larger audience. And he was doing his. Um, he, he was, was doing, doing his... it from the Ecuadorian embassy, in fact. And, and what's really strange is 
there's a show. If you can still see it online, I advise everybody to see it. It's it's a show that he interviews um, the Slovenian communist um, Slovoj Žižek oh, and no. David Horowitz at the same time. He has David Horowitz and Slovoj Žižek and David Horowitz. And in the middle of this interview, Slovoj Žižek has this epiphany and he looks at David Horowitz and he says, I know what you are. You're a communist with a human face. <laughs> And he's like, oh, he's just beside himself the whole time. He had this epiphany right. and the whole rest of the thing, he's cracking all these jokes. And even even um, David Horowitz is is giggling a little bit. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, because David Horowitz, just for those who don't know, he's a famous former, he wrote Radical Sunny. He's a former American communist um, who supposedly changed sides and voted for Reagan in, in 1984. And of course, the reason he gave for voting for Reagan was that Betty Van Patter, his his secretary at Ramparts Magazine, he had loaned her out to the Black Panthers and they murdered her and hmm. dubbed her body in Oakland Bay. And uh, I guess they tortured and murdered her first. There was an accounting glitch, apparently, and the communists don't like accounting glitches. Um, and so he felt that now communism is evil because they murdered his accountant. Um, but then this letter appeared from Betty Van Patter's daughter in the San Francisco Chronicle saying, David Horowitz is a liar. My mother was never his friend. He didn't get her the job at, uh, at, uh, with the Panthers. He didn't do this. And so his whole reason in his book for changing sides and dumping communism and becoming a, uh, a Reagan voter was just blown up, mm. you know, by the daughter of the lady that he claimed to be guilty of, 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 uh, being part of her death. So uh, anyway, so to have Horowitz on the same show with Zizek and having that event, and of course, a clueless Julian Assange, I think uh, a lot of the audience was clueless too. They didn't get the inside yeah. joke that Zizek did. And there's so many shady characters in all of this. Of course, there was um, Roger Stone um, at some point. Um, Roger Stone at some point worked for Alex Jones and uh, also Jerome Corsi worked for Alex Jones briefly. And, um, and there were some shenanigans where Rogers, Roger Stone was bragging that, you know, he had connections to WikiLeaks of some sort and also to the Trump campaign. Which um, got him into trouble. Yeah. yeah. And, and of course, um, you know, this was this was uh, a very important. This, this was a leak done by WikiLeaks at a very convenient time, and so people started to look into that. And and then this, that's when Roger Stone um, backtracked and he said, "No, nah, I was just bragging. I didn't have any real connection to WikiLeaks." And, In other uh, words, he was lying, right? He was I, to puff I don't, himself. I don't, I don't trust the guy. And um, and it's it's a bit it becomes a big problem because i think that jerome corsi uh, at some point started to spill the beans and um roger stone was not happy about that and so who knows what other charges may be filed against various people once julian assange is in the united states and and has to explain things under oath and many gets convicted you know other people may get indicted as well um because it's like you know it's 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 the allure of um having the option of having WikiLeaks publish something at a convenient, at a very convenient point. So we'll find well, out. Well, here's point. a sidebar on Roger Stone. You know that Roger Stone just came out with a book, I think it was last year, The Man Who Killed Kennedy, The Case Against LBJ. Have you seen uh, this? No, I haven't seen that yet. And this is really strange, right? That suddenly Roger Stone, who's supposed to be a conservative good guy, is piling on to this 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 thing that the communists would like to blame Johnson, of course, and of course it's it's this claim that Johnson was behind the Kennedy assassination, which there was another earlier book on this. I forget the author. I read it last year when I was going through the Kennedy stuff, and I really regret reading it. It's, it was like it's like I lost IQ points because this book had no evidence. There was not yeah. a shred of evidence in the book. It was just about how LBJ was corrupt, and somehow that proved that he killed Kennedy. Right. Yeah, it's like it's like they they pile on they pile on so many things, and it's always the same framing. And you know, the the basic framing is always the same, and that's when when you when you um, 
condition the audience long enough over decades, um, they will jump to conclusions. You know, when there's a new thing, yeah. they will believe, oh, it's exactly like this older case and, and exactly like this other older case. And every case right. is the and same. You know, it's always the same. It's always, you know, the CIA. Yeah, and it's, a, it's always an alibi for the KGB and yeah. the Cubans. <laughs> Always exactly, an alibi. No. It's like you just gave them an alibi by, by making yeah. somebody else guilty. I mean, it's just uh, it's ridiculous because when you go through it carefully, you see that there was I mean, this is the weird thing. John F. Kennedy was shot by a self-described Marxist. Lee Harvey Oswald. Who, who spent got time to, in the Soviet Union. Can, yeah, who defected the Soviet Union and came back with a Russian wife, uh, uh, Marina Oswald. But it's interesting. You can, I think, right now you can go to YouTube and you can hear Oswald was in a radio debate in um, uh, New Orleans with another guy and describes himself as a Marxist, describes himself as a communist, um, uh, and and of course Sirhan Sirhan, who shot Robert F. Kennedy, they they found in his in, in his possessions, personal possessions, uh, like a diary saying, I want to be a good communist or things to this effect. And how the guy was, a, I mean, the PLO is a communist organization. Yasser Arafat was trained in the Soviet Union. And so you have these Kennedy brothers are both shot by communists. And yeah. that's just a fact. And it's like everything to try to say, oh, no, they were CIA agents. They weren't communists, you know. So wait a minute. <laughs> and, and and But there's never any real proof of this. It's just claimed and they put together this convoluted series of evidence that doesn't really connect anything. And and people believe it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's like this whole um this whole WikiLeaks thing. I mean, uh we can assume that because of Julian's father, who was also an activist and he visited the um the Syrian regime at some point, and I think his Julian's father also talked nonsense about Ukraine. Um we can assume that Julian was in, had some sort of contact with um, leftist literature. Um, apparently, Julian was not a traditional truther, so he was not into um, classic conspiracy media. This was also a, a a point of friction between Julian and Alex Jones. So Alex Jones, Infowars, um, he tried to have Julian Assange on for a long time, and. Assange would never come on the show. And Alex was complaining about that and saying, Assange will not give us the time of the day. And he couldn't figure out why. Um, so Assange, not necessarily a traditional truther, um, unlike the infamous Karl Koch hacker from the 80s, from Germany. Um, but um, yeah, we, we can still assume that Assange was into into some left-wing literature, anti-American stuff. And we know for certain that Daniel Berg, who was very instrumental in WikiLeaks, we know he's on the left. I mean, he says he is. His wife is a communist politician in Germany. Um, and so this was, they, they, they see the world through this baseline communist framing and they were acting according to that framing. They believe they could change the world by leaking, quote, unquote, um, secrets but none of these guys had any training or any sort of specific education in intelligence matters and and empires and uh, you know wars and none of that they were simply and of course the really the really dark secrets the ones that matter the most are the ones held by russia and china yeah those are the secrets i want to know but we yeah. never get to see into them we we get defectors from once in a while and the defectors are then dumped on and discredited and so nobody yeah. will listen to them i mean there was a a young kid i mean i believe he was 17 at the time when he joined wikileaks um he has a swedish name i think he's from sweden and uh and so uh this kid uh, became a member of wikileaks and nobody really trusted him especially daniel berg he says this this kid is strange and he just apparently embezzled some wikileaks money nobody really trusted him but assange for some strange reasons would um work with this kid and give this kid access and at some point this young guy um collab started to collaborate with the united states government i think with the fbi and he gave the fbi hard drives for or copies of uh, wikileaks hard drives um, so data from within, internal communications. So this was a leak of WikiLeaks. So this is what they never wanted to happen. They didn't want 
um, transparency about their own organizations. They didn't want anybody to find out the truth about themselves, but it happened. So um, when Assange is is in a, an American court, we will probably get to see some stuff that was handed over by this young guy, and um, we may get some interesting uh, some interesting leads, you know, into um, into all kinds of uh, into all kinds of directions. Um, yeah, and there was this Icelandic this Icelandic um, initiative where WikiLeaks went to Iceland and they um, they were hoping to get the laws changed to where Iceland becomes a haven for essentially pro Russian hackers and activists. So you can store all, you can put the servers in Iceland and nobody could touch them. And you can harm the United States from Iceland. Um, and they expected that the United States could not do anything about that. So they, they wanted to have um, redundancy and, and legal safety so they could do whatever they wanted. I mean, it's a bit of a an interesting business model if you think about it. You know, you have WikiLeaks, you get stuff sent in for free. And then you just publish it and you get donations for that. I mean, it's, it's an interesting business model. That's pretty easy business model, isn't it? You just yeah. wait for people and, um, to send you juicy stuff and you just you just get the yeah. credit. Oh, and there's something that many people may not be aware of. Uh, it's called the Chinese package. And this is something really interesting. Um, it was mentioned in various books. I think I've read all books that came out uh, about WikiLeaks. Um, even some in Spanish because I was... Um, my Spanish was good enough at the time, so I could even read a Spanish book on WikiLeaks. And um, so this was like um, this was like something that's very embarrassing to WikiLeaks. Um, so right from the beginning, okay. So this is when nobody really knows WikiLeaks. They're just starting to getting to gain some traction. Um, WikiLeaks is starting to brag um, towards other people, you know, to to get their support. They're bragging that they already have hundreds of thousands of documents. And everybody was at was wondering where did they get this stuff from? Because nobody really knew who WikiLeaks was. How did they get hundreds of thousands of documents? And um and so there is there were some internal communications and some statements about this. And um what we can piece together is this. It seems like um, people, you know, around WikiLeaks, maybe, um, they stole material that others had stolen. And, and the theft happened during the transport of, um, of this, this, this data. Because, um, it was, it was not just the hackers and the activists using the so-called Tor network. Now Tor is a is is a, a tool that that everybody uses these days in these hacker circles. It's a bunch of servers spread all around the world, and um, if you want to send data from point A to B, it doesn't go in a straight line from A to B. It zigzags all around the world from one of these special servers to the next, and so when it reaches the destination, supposedly um, you cannot intercept it and you cannot trace where it came from but there were flaws in the system and, and the experts have noted these flaws in the Tor network and um, there were strong indications and this was in various books strong indications that Chinese hackers and others um, Chinese hackers and others had stolen information from the West transported it over the Tor network but some people involved in Tor intercepted the data because anybody can set up a Tor server or what they call an exit node. So if you know how to work the system and if you have, if you know the weaknesses, you can intercept the traffic and copy it unencrypted. And so um, this is apparently, allegedly, where this Chinese mega package uh, came from. So WikiLeaks was sitting on a lot of stuff that did not come from whistleblowers. It, it, this was not whistleblower material. This was just stolen stuff. And um, at some point, uh, Daniel Berg actually, uh, Daniel Berg left WikiLeaks and um, he took, I think he took the Chinese package with him and he destroyed it or he claims to have um, destroyed it. 
So, um, yeah, this is one of the biggest secrets that it hasn't been uncovered yet. What was in the Chinese package? And there were internal emails from WikiLeaks that ended up on websites like Cryptome. Now, Cryptome has been around for a long time, and it sort of works the same way as WikiLeaks. They publish stuff from around the world that is somewhat secret. And um, so... Um, at some point, WikiLeaks wanted the support of Cryptome, but the guy who runs Cryptome was very skeptical. And um, um, at some point, Cryptome published internal emails from WikiLeaks. And these emails, I think they're still on the web. And um, there's one particular mail that was also quoted in one of these books, I think a, a German book by um, from authors from Spiegel magazine. And uh, in this email... It was bragged. We have all this stuff from around the world. We are drowning in data. We, we cannot even store it all. And uh, we have material on this group and on that group and on this group and on that group. And there's some cryptic references in that mail. Uh, something like when the Russians or this group or that group, when they bury into targets, we take that stuff. We copy their stuff and then we have it. So this is one of the biggest remaining mysteries um, of WikiLeaks, you know, this mysterious Chinese package that, um, you know, with unclear origins. Um, and, um, and so this is the level of transparency you actually get from WikiLeaks. None. They will not tell you how they operate um, and, uh, and where the stuff all ca came from and, and just none of it. I mean... People have to imagine that something got leaked on WikiLeaks. I mean, something about a bank or an organization. How do you know this didn't come from a competitor? Let's say one bank wants to harm the other bank. They steal information from the other bank and then send it to WikiLeaks and they publish it, right? I mean, how do you make sure you're not doing somebody else's dirty work? Um, yeah, this is sort of um, the legacy of... Um, this is sort of the legacy of of WikiLeaks that um that is um yeah that's going on to this very day because the methods didn't die with you know the WikiLeaks organization so the same stuff is going on I mean people spread around vulnerabilities and they hackers they break into these targets they steal information and then they try to auction it off or they sell it to some government intelligence agency or they may sell it to journalists. Um, and um, I mean, it was always sort of on the mind of certain hackers to create something like WikiLeaks and have it be a great scam. So let's let's say, for example, you have an org you have a group of ten hackers, just hypothetically, a group of ten hackers. Uh, five of those hackers, they create a whistleblowing organization with a website, and they run it. And the other five, are not directly attached to this organization, but they go around and they steal information and then they send it in to the whistleblowing platform and they launder the data so it's obfuscated where it came from. So it's actually one group. It's, ten, it's the same 10 people and they know each other and they steal stuff and then they sort of launder the data and then they publish it and get donations for it. They can monetize the material that way. And... um. Yeah, it's 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 questionable where all this WikiLeaks stuff came from, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's highly um, it's highly questionable where all this stuff came from. And uh, by you know, creating, you know, the th you know the thing about leaking information. I go back to the Pentagon Papers. Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg was a protege of Henry Kissinger, believe it or not. And of course, if you read the Pentagon Papers, which kind of is they give just it's what it is is it's young left-wing academics hired by the pentagon and told we want you to write you know different justifications for being in vietnam just think of whatever you can think of and of course there are left-wing you know people out of academia writing these papers for the pentagon so they say oh yeah well we're there for you know tungsten for light bulbs because if we don't defend vietnam we won't have cheap cheap light bulbs which is it was just nonsense. It was idiotic nonsense. But they would, they would try to make it sound like imperialism because that's what they believed. 
<clears throat> that America was in Vietnam for imperialistic reasons. So then you go and you leak these papers. So the left goes and leaks the papers that leftists in the Pentagon created out of their mm -hmm. minds, out of their twisted perspective. And it's, oh, how evil the Pentagon is there for the, it's like, no, you idiot is a protege of Henry Kissinger. <laughs> and then the real irony is Nixon didn't care. He says, well, that's the Johnson administration. We didn't do that. I don't care about that. And Henry Kissinger comes to Nixon and says, oh, you were, um, you're, you're, you're looking weak. You can't look weak, Mr. President. You have to do something to Daniel Ellsberg, which then brought in the White House plumbers to, uh, to go uh, break into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office, right? Which it, it just makes, it's just the bungling and our own left-wing idiocy is being exposed. That's all that's happening. Yeah. You know, it's I mean, like a it's a tail chasing. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me that um, Mr. Daniel Berg never got arrested or um, that he never seemingly got into trouble with the Americans, even though he was involved in all of this very deeply involved. I mean, he admits in his book that um, by putting out so many documents, um, Body Rock in Afghanistan, it was fairly easy to deduct who was an informant who was helping the coalition forces against you know the radicals the crazies and so this endangered a lot of people and their families but um, nobody ever apparently bothered Mr. Daniel Berg even though everybody knew who he was where he lived um, he was he was very easy to find now um, in Daniel now, Berg and Daniel Ellsberg really yeah yeah <laughs> Daniel not the coincidence Dan, Daniel Berg it's pretty I'm, funny and um, now, there's a, there's a specific um, context when it comes to Germany, right? So when, uh, when, when World War II was over, um, American, American military intelligence rebuilt everything here. So the political system, restarting the, co the corporations and, and setting up, you know, um, the telecommunications industry and all that. So... Of course, um, counter counterintelligence was built into everything from the very start. Now, of course, these these left wing guys they always say it's it's the fascist imperialist pigs. But I mean, uh, when Germany was divided, the East had an invasion army ready, and their spies were everywhere. So it's a bit of an it's 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 very uh, infantile to just view counterintelligence per se as as evil. Um, but um, this. This system built by the Americans, it runs very deep and it's not just, you know, the technological side of it, um, but it's also the legal side of it. Um, there are experts, legal experts that have written, written books about this and um, it's a very complicated system of laws in Germany um, that... Um, and, and these laws make it possible for uh, the United States to conduct counterintelligence here and it's there's so many elements of it and and parts of it are still secret um so for example if there is an important investigation the americans um they have they have the right to intervene they have all kinds of um privileges to take over the investigation i think they can pretty much extract anybody any source uh, take over any case and and just handle these things because you know, frankly, uh, we can't handle anything. Um, German intelligence was terrible. It was always infiltrated by by the Soviets, and so um, we're idiots when it comes to that. And um, and so by with these existing laws and regulations and mechanisms, it is quite staggering to me that Daniel Berg was uh, never never got into trouble. Maybe he did. Maybe it was all very covert, and he's not really at liberty to talk about this but this is something that people need to be aware of when it comes to this case um that um you know the number two of wikileaks at the most important time the number two of wikileaks was a german guy and he was handling the most important stuff because assange was he was he was like assange must have been like on the autism spectrum or had adhd or something because um assange was always late his organizational skills were terrible he couldn't find his way to a destination. Um, Daniel Beck says he would get lost in a phone booth, essentially. Now, if people actually remember phone booths. Uh, and so um, 
so uh, Daniel Berg was handling a lot of the internal tasks, and and he was he was WikiLeaks for for to a large degree. And so, um, yeah, I mean, why wasn't Daniel Berg arrested, confronted? I mean, what was going on? That was this was very very strange, um, because this all this stuff directly affected American security and American foreign policy. And uh, it's 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 weird that Daniel Berg was was doing this from Germany, even though there is a special relationship between Germany and the United States. And also, at the height of the leaks, Assange went to Great Britain. Why? And I have never, ever heard anybody really ask the question why, and I've never heard a good answer why. Because Britain is obviously a close ally of the United States. And um, I mean, this one country that would extradite Assange, uh, it was the one country that would extradite Assange the quickest, Britain, right? Why did he go to Britain? Uh, and it, and it, I remember the days when the leaks happened and it was a global sensation and many people just assumed that Assange was on the run. He was, he was always on the move, dodging the Americans and the CIA was chasing him. But no, he, he flew into Britain on his passport. He contacted the authorities, told him where he was staying and, uh, and he was allowed to stay. And that was really odd. And and we know how problematic Britain is. I mean, Britain is extremely infiltrated by the Russians on all kinds of levels. Yeah, and, in uh, fact, uh, it's the country where the Russians conduct the most assassinations outside yeah. of Russia. Exactly. Yeah. So wh why? Why did he go to Britain? I mean, people make a big fuzz about the the sweden thing when he went to sweden and he treated these women that way and they um went to the police and then sweden issued a sweden issued the special arrest warrant and um when you when you're inside of europe um there is a possibility that this case escalates and you can then you get deported to that specific country for example uh sweden right now, people make a big fuss about Sweden and all that, but forget Sweden. I mean, Sweden could also could have also, uh, ex, you know, extradited, deported Assange to the United States. I mean, Sweden could have done that. But he chose for, to a large, for a large um, amount of time, he chose to be in Britain. Why? I mean, you can whine all day about, oh, he's in prison and he was in the embassy and now he's in prison and... Uh, and oh my God, Britain this, um, Britain that. Why did he even go there? Who protected him? Wh who in the British system actually, uh, you know, yeah, protected him? That is also an interesting question that has not been answered um, to this yeah, very well, day.